Now, from a young age, all of us have been taught about freedom, right? We know that the system of governance that we call democracy has allowed us to achieve great things. And, and even though there have been bumps along the road in our history, from the institution of slavery to the struggle of recognizing that women have a right to vote, to our continued struggle to understand whether convicted felons who serve their time should be have their voting rights restored, we recognize and we lift up the words of Thomas Jefferson as he says in the 1776 Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal. At the heart of the story of our country that we live in, especially found in Count Thomas Jefferson's Declaration, is the desire from, of freedom from tyranny and the freedom of expression. Would you all agree with that? That's kind of what our story is. The freedom from tyranny and the freedom of expression. Now, when we argue as people about what freedom means, we argue that freedom may only extend to the tip of our nose, that we, have, that we are individuals, but, but after that we have a responsibility to society, and, and we have all kinds of social controls and laws to control. That's on one very end of democracy, and on the other end of democracy is the idea that, well, everything should be free. We should be able to have license to do anything that we want as long as it doesn't harm another. Most Americans, though, are somewhere in the middle. I think we would argue that too, that, that we enjoy our freedoms, but there are limits to those, and, and for maybe societal reasons, maybe for ethical reasons, that we should have uh, some limits to those freedoms. Now, I speak about freedom today because that is the focus of Paul's letter to the Galatians. Last week, we spoke a little bit about the cultural context of the letters, the letter to Galatia, which it's not just a particular place, but the whole region of an area that Paul had uh, met with pagan um, people and, and converted them to Christianity, and all these different cities were in a, a part of the Roman Empire uh, that was called Galatia. Now, what happened is that Paul left. Paul created these churches, left, and then Jewish Christian missionaries from Jerusalem came in, and, and they started preaching a different gospel, saying, well, Paul wasn't entirely right. You, you forgot a few things. And so they started teaching about how it was important that the pagans needed to, to, who became Christians, they needed to take on all of the feast days of the Jewish faith. They needed to take on the, the Mosaic laws found in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. They needed to even be circumcised in the same way that Abraham, Abraham and his family were when he received the promise from God to be fruitful. Well, these arguments must have gained traction in the churches of Galatia because Paul writes this angry letter. I think we talked a little bit about that last week, how angry he was. He didn't even include the, the special um, recognition of all those he had met and who he had guided over the time he was there. Now, the question then becomes, why was Paul so angry? Why? And why does it matter to us in a church that is 2,000 years removed and separated from that time of this letter. Well, there are four things that Paul believes that the, the Christians, the Jewish Christian missionaries were bringing in that is really destructive to an understanding of God. Now, Paul teaches first that faith, it's only faith that can save us. It's not legal obedience to the law. He says it's God's grace reaching down to us, not our own efforts that results in salvation, and that was a very key part of his theology. Last week, we heard about God's radical grace that brings us into a full relationship with God, and how it's God acting on us, not us acting um, to infuse that salvation. Secondly, in Galatians, Paul teaches that Christ's death is a pivotal moment in history. It, it's not just the story about Jesus atoning for our sins. Now, to talk a little bit about that. In, in Jewish times, there was a day of atonement that happened once a year, and what happened is that a sacrifice, a very special sacrifice, was made in the temple, and one day, there was just one day, the high priest would go into where the Ark of the Covenant was, and, and the Holy of Holies, and would ask for forgiveness uh, for the whole of Israel. And so there was a belief among many Jewish Christians that, well, Jesus is just replacing that scapegoat. And Jesus is that atoning sacrifice for us. And, and so, uh, for Paul, that's not his understanding. He doesn't see uh, Jesus being primarily about an atoning sacrifice, a blood sacrifice. Instead, 
Paul argues for something entirely new. He says that what Jesus did breaks all of the things that happened before, all the laws that happened before, all the previous relationships that God created through the Jewish faith, all of that is gone. The cross is a cataclysmic event that inaugurates the new creation that God has made us brand new through this act. And it's not an act of sacrifice, it is an act of love that Jesus gave himself up. Here are the words from Galatians 3. It says, Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinary. For in Christ, you are all children of God through faith. And as many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And so what Paul is saying is that, yeah, we have this law, and the law was important because it was a law that kept us in the right path. But now that we have faith, it is faith that keeps us in the right path, not just mere obedience to law, because we can choose which laws to obey and which laws we don't want to obey. Faith, and as a gift from God, allows us to respond with love. Thirdly, Paul argues that because of the cross, the Holy Spirit is given to all who believe. In the letter to Galatians, we hear that the Spirit gives us life, that the Spirit confirms our status as equal children of God, and that the Spirit transforms the character of what it means to be a part of God's whole community called the church. Because of the Holy Spirit, we do good things, not just as individuals, but as communities. And we desire to please God in all the ways that we relate to each other and to the world. And fourthly, because, and finally, because God gives us equality, because the cross transforms the world, because we are no longer controlled by the things that enslave us, we have the freedom to love. We are united. There are no divisions. There are no divisions such as uh, gender, or there are no separations based on race, or based on where you come from, or based even on where you were in your religious heritage before you came to Christ. Paul writes, there is no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free, no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but do you hear echoes of Paul in Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence? To go back to all men are created equal, really was, um, in some ways, kind of derivative of what Paul is writing here in Galatians, isn't it? Paul says that Christ has set us free. And in, in chapter 5 of Galatians, he says, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self indulgence, but through love have become slaves to one another. The whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you will not be consumed by one another. So Paul is, is warning us that that freedom exists. Yes, we have freedom. We have freedom to be who we are, who we want to be. But don't let that freedom just be about self-enjoyment. Uh, it's about the freedom to love other people, that, that we are free not to do things because the culture tells us or because that we feel shame or we're not you know, obeying the law or, or any of these things. We said we have a freedom from all those other things. We have the freedom to choose to love each other. I think it's interesting. You bite and devour one another. Take care that you're not consumed by one another. Anybody feel that way about our modern culture a bit, that we like to bite and consume one another? A whole lot. Um, and the thing is, we know that in America, freedom is not easy. Our history has taught us that. The words that were written in 1776 by Thomas Jefferson really have not been solidified. Even now, we try very hard to solidify those words. But um, you know, the British, it took 40 years before the British finally gave up trying to to cheat us. In 1815, when the War of 1812 got ended, they stopped trying to get rid of our government. Um, and again, 
is in the Civil War. And we, we argue about whether uh, people of different races uh, had as much status as another. Um, and again, we argued about uh, equality when it came to women receiving the right to vote. And again, we argued about equality when we had the Voting Rights Act of 1964 that finally ended legal discrimination. The struggle for freedom and what that means for all that exists in our country is still being wrestled with all over the community as well in the United States. And we struggle, I think, not only what freedom means as a community or as a country, but we struggle with what freedom means as individuals. And I think we choose um, to struggle with freedom because we struggle with the idea that we enslave ourselves to our selfish desires. We do things that we ought not do. We get mired in secret sins and lies. We get caught up in traps of addiction and that are both physical and emotional. And Paul has his own list of things that he says, oh, here are the things of the flesh. Here are the things that will cause you to be enslaved and, and, and for you to just kind of make a joke of the freedom that God gives you. He says, live by the Spirit. Do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to God's Holy Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For those, for these are opposed to each other, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, murder, drunkenness, morality, and things like these. Now, Paul was writing to a specific time and a specific place, but I think we could read these same ethical lists and say, yeah, there are many things that, that cause us not to have freedom in our world, right? Uh, especially when we get into conflict and we argue with one another and, and we gossip about each other. Uh, and even when we just engage our own selfishness and not consider other people in our lives, uh, these are things that can um, be hindrances to freedom. And these things will also lead us away from God. And these things will lead us away from the freedom to love, not only ourselves, but others, too. So Paul gives us hope. Because of Jesus, because of the cross, we are already experiencing God's freedom. We are set free from the slavery to sin and guilt when we follow God. But I think sometimes that freedom is overwhelming. Sometimes we get lost in the freedom of this world and we find ourselves looking back to the old ways of legalism instead of trusting the Holy Spirit to guide our community. Paul reminds the Galatians that the Holy Spirit bears fruit in the lives of believers. He writes love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, and self-control. These are the fruit that combat the negative excesses of selfish freedom. Now, as I was preparing for the sermon, I, I read about the fact that Martin Luther, uh, the author of the Reformation, a Roman Catholic priest who had uh, lived in the 1500s, that Galatians was, was the letter that inspired him to really fight against the powers of the church at the time. Now, the big thing that was going on during the 1500s that he had a trouble with was something called the selling of indulgences. Does anybody know what the, an indulgence is? John, yeah, you want to tell us? Sure. Um, it was back, back in the war, uh, Jesus and Jesus and Moses and Christ and then you okay, so if we had sinned, we should go and find a way out. Exactly. So, so instead of like a instead of doing things to actually change your life or change your patterns, you just take money to the church and say, okay, you get uh, free murders today, so here's money. Free fundraiser for the church, right? <laughs> That's how they were able to build all their humongous, beautiful churches back in the 1400s or 1500s. So the way that they were able to pay for their wars as as the Pope would do a holy crusade. So. Um, and, and Martin Luther had major problems with that idea that you could pay your way out of sin. Because he said that just takes away from the gospel, doesn't it? Because it's God's grace that is offered to us, not that we can do anything to receive sinlessness. So um, Martin Luther saw deep similarities of the church of his time with what was going on. And the struggle that Paul had with these teachers coming in to to say that there was even more that you could do to change the way that God works. Now, in our day and age, we are also struggling with this interpretation of the scripture.
university live in a culture that is highly individualistic. Um, we have a, a culture that believes in personal freedom over all else. Would you agree with that? I mean, we live in a world that's all about our own pleasure, isn't it? You know, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, you know, I can do whatever I want. And that's a struggle for us, because eventually, although everybody having their own way means that nobody has a way, right? Because we're going to infringe on somebody else at some point. We're also challenged by new ideas, and we often clash over those ideas. We are confronted with different efforts, ethical frameworks, not just physical frameworks, but others that have emerged over time. And, and I think the temptation is that because of all these challenges and these new ideas, and because of the conflict we see in our culture, that we might tend to go back to that legalism again. And we try to create these moral laws that, that you have to do this, and we don't understand. Um, we tend to pick and choose what we like in, in the name of God. And so we struggle as a church and as individuals. What does freedom mean for us? And, and, and how do we view freedom as a church? And how do we view freedom as individuals who have been called by God to different types of people? Now, I don't have any easy answers. I wish I could go for another sermon, I guess, about this. But I have no easy answer. And I, but I do have a challenge to you. And I have a challenge that comes from Paul in chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Stand firm in the freedom that is won for you by Christ. Do not be yoked to gain slavery. And so, I say to you, if you're struggling with the freedom, and you're struggling with uh, these ideas of, of all these things going on, remember that Christ has already offered you freedom. There's his salvation offered on the cross. Let us pray.